Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for the Live Comics Creators Unite panel. Um, I am joined by the lovely Lila Sturgis this evening. Hi, Lila. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing okay. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you to everyone who was able to join us. And if you're not here live, um, I hope you enjoy this when you do get around to, to seeing this. So Lila, um, we're going to jump into questions if that sounds good to you. You know, anything sounds good to me right now. I've been yeah. at home by myself <laughs> for two weeks. I'm a little loopy. So, you know, it's going to be fun no matter what. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's just do it. Let's just do All it. right. Yeah, let's let's see where we end up. So the good or bad news is neither of us are probably going to end up in like Vegas after this call. So <laughs> it can't get too crazy, but we'll see what happens. You never know. <laughs> you, you don't. So Lila, for those of you who are not familiar with your work um, or how it is you came into comics, can you share a little bit about how it was that you got your start in the comics industry? Oh my gosh. My history is so weird when it comes to comics. Like if, if someone was looking for a pathway into comics, I am like everything you should do to avoid that. Um, <laughs> and then maybe you'll succeed in comics. I, I did not grow up reading comic books, was not interested in comics. I thought they were dumb and for kids. Um, when I got into college, I had a friend named Chris Robertson who um, went on to create a number of uh, really amazing comic book series like iZombie. Um, and um, he sort of pushed them on me. He was like, no, you have to read these. these they're really good comics. It's not all, you know, zap, wow, bow. And so I started reading things like Sandman and um, Shade the Changing Man and all, like all the, um, the British imports. Uh, that were happening in the, the late 80s. That was kind of my thing. Um, and I thought, okay, well, this is pretty cool, but, um, you know, fine. And, and I went off and um, I wanted to be a uh, rock star. That was my goal in life, um, not to be a writer at all. So I moved to California to become a rock star. That did not work out. <laughs> Um, so rock star wise, what were you, were you going to be the lead singer? Were you going to be an instrumentalist? Like where in the band were you, would you have fit? Sure. I was a singer songwriter. Um, uh, I would have, you know, tried to have been in like a, a maybe an Elliot Smith type situation or maybe a Sarah McLachlan type situation given the time period. Um, that was sort of my dream in life was to become a famous singer-songwriter. And uh, it did not pan out. Uh, one of the things that I realized that sort of took my enthusiasm away was when I had friends who were in working bands and I saw the conditions under which they lived, like living out of a van. The vans do not smell good. <laughs> and I thought, this is not a life for me. I'm a person of creature comforts. What else could I do? Um, so I gave up on my music dream um, and I moved back to Texas and um, I fell in with a group of writers and one of those writers was Bill Willingham of Fables fame, who at the time wasn't really doing very much and he wanted to start a, a prose writing group. And I still had absolutely zero interest in writing comic books. I wanted to write novels. Um, so we started this writing group <clears throat> And I was working on my epic fantasy novel. And a few years later, uh, Bill was very famous doing Fables. And they wanted to do a spinoff of Fables called Jack of Fables. And Bill didn't want to write it himself. So he called me up and said, would you like to write this with me? And I went, yeah, I guess. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst, I tell you, it's the worst <laughs> story. And anyone who wants to get into comics, when I tell the story, they're like, oh, come on. Sure, anyone else should have been writing comics other than you. And it's true, I should not be here. Um, and so I did that. I, I wrote a bunch of superhero comics for a long time. And, um, and some, I did some things for Vertigo, like House of Mystery. Um, and I, it was okay. Um, but then um, and I started to have a lot of uh, 
problems about relating to gender and I was getting really unhappy and I was having a lot of problems in my personal life. It was making it really difficult for me to write. Um, and I came out as trans in December of 2016. Um, and that really changed everything. You know, my relationship to my career, my relationship to my writing, my relationship to the industry. I started writing books that I felt were really suited to me, like Lumberjanes and The Magicians and some other things that I've got in the works. And, um, and so now I'm at, I'm at a really comfortable Did we lose you, Layla? So it looks like we're having some some technical difficulties. Lila froze up. I think that our interview is getting a little too intense. So we're going to see if we can reconnect with her. Um, you know, there is a lot of bandwidth uh, going through Zoom these days. So we're going to see if we can't get her back as soon as possible. So for those of you who are in the audience, again, thank you so much for joining. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We will be with you um, in just a moment. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I, I think what happened is you decided to go off and have fun without us, which you said you were going to see where things went. And now I see how it is. And, you know, I'm disappointed you didn't take us with you. So I'm really sorry. <laughs> so welcome back. Um, Hi. Yeah, it's technology. And you know, I think people understand with with everyone living online that um, there's going to be stuff like that that happens. So um, yeah, but you know, just to provide a short wrap up to your previous question, you know, if, if how did I get into comics? You know, people ask me, how do I get into comics? I always tell them, don't be interested in comics, try to be a rock star, change genders, and you'll be golden. Like, it's just never fails. Okay. You know, that sounds like solid advice. Even if you don't think you need to follow those steps, maybe explore <laughs> is the way to go because look at where you are. And for someone who's disinterested in, in comics, you've done some really amazing stuff. Um, we did have a question from an audience member who wanted to know if you're still writing songs at all. I am still writing songs. I just, I wrote a song um, just the other day and posted it on my uh, Twitter it's just sort of a, like a, everything's going to be okay, little folk song. Um, and I've been sort of like playing little songs and goofing around on my guitar on Twitter um, over the past couple of weeks, just because I'm stuck at home like everybody else and it's a fun release. So I'm, so I'm actually working on a new song right now. I've got a couple. The, the one that I started working on today is called The Ballad of Tom Nook. And it's about... Um, Animal Crossing and being a uh, <laughs> a wage slave in the world of of Animal Crossing, it's I'm workshopping it. Okay, so that brings me to a completely random question, based off of what you just said. There, are you on Animal Crossing? Because I feel like everyone is, except for me. So, um, are you playing right now? Well, not just, literally right now. <laughs> just started playing yesterday, um, and it's because everyone seemed like it was really soothing them. And I thought I, I would like to be soothed right now. So I started playing yesterday and it's so nice. Um, you know, uh, there, there's every problem has a solution and everyone's very friendly. And, um, you know, my, my cohabitants on the, the island are just a, some very perky animals and, um, you know, and my daughter let me visit her island and she gave me a, a ladder, which was very helpful. And 
so it's a really wonderful thing to escape into. Um, I'm glad it exists. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I haven't played. I don't own it, um, but I see it everywhere. And so it's one of those things where I'm like, am I going to join everyone else? Like, am I going to jump on that bandwagon? Um, I haven't yet. I'm not like opposed uh, in principle, just I don't, I don't have it. So uh, awesome. I'm glad that you got a ladder. That was very nice of her to, to share that with you. Um, <laughs> but kind of jumping back into mm -hmm. to comics. Um, yeah. So you did mention some of the, the comics that you're working on towards the, um, towards the past or for these past few years rather mm -hmm. um, have been things that are a little bit more, uh, they're less superhero. They're a little bit more uh, storytelling wise, which he seemed to be more comfortable with um, than the superhero lore. Mm -hmm. um, what project, regardless of when you worked on it, um, has taught you the most about comics? Oh my goodness. That's a great question. What has taught me the most about comics? Hmm. 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 Of my current over the um, the work that I'm doing now since I transitioned, I would say it's got to be um, the Magician's Alice's story. It's a 160 page graphic novel that I invested a lot of time and energy in. And while I was doing it, I was thinking a lot about the form of comics, um, the format of the medium, um, and a lot of, I, I could get really bogged down in like details about craft, like, like pacing and panel counts and dialogue and how it's spaced and how it reads on the page. Um, but I was thinking about a lot of these things because I was going through a very difficult time in my life when I was writing it and it was an escape um, to sort of dive into this book and make it, um, and do it as, in a way that was as deep as possible for me. So there's a, a ton of effort that went into that book. I hope it doesn't feel that way. I hope it reads very smoothly. Um, but I was working out a lot of the ways in which I want to write comics going forward. You know, what's my style? Um, how do I approach the medium? Uh, how do I get the most use out of it for me, for the way I like to tell stories? So do you feel like there was a notable uh, or noticeable change in how you wrote things after you got to the other side of writing that story? Or do you feel like that was really powerful within that, but that you're more likely to adapt to the needs of, of the stories themselves? Oh, it was very much uh, a sea change in, in terms of emphasis for me. Um, I, I think in the past, I was always more of a plot driven creator. You know, I wanted to create stories that had interesting and engaging plots. Um, while also having well-rounded characters. Um, and now I feel like I'm a writer who wants to tell stories about well-rounded characters and showing the journeys that they're going through while also telling good stories, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it, it's more a question of emphasis than anything, but I, I, I think it makes a big difference. Just it, it's what you allow more space for, mm -hmm. I think. And at this point in my life, I want to allow more space for characters to... Um, I'm so tempted to say breathe. I don't know why. It give the characters room to breathe uh, mm -hmm. and explore the space. Um, that kind of thing. I'm just going to zhuzh my hair a little bit. I can see myself. <laughs> my hair's a little flat. So we're just going to take this opportunity to just kind of. I think you look amazing. But yes, you do. You. It's going to make you feel 100%. <laughs> uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to look cute because this is like the first time anyone has seen me in a very long time. And so I like, this is like a very cute party dress that I'm wearing right now. And I'm wearing like these really pretty earrings that my mom got me. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my best. That's all I can say. Well, I have to say we feel honored that you chose this opportunity to dress up for us. What's been your, um, your regular wear? Like, are you kind of a, a big baggy t-shirt person or are you sweats? Like, what have you been rocking these past few weeks that you've been in isolation? Um, for about four days in a row, I wore the same booty shorts and purple camisole everywhere I went. And I, so like, I barely left the house. I, I drove to Starbucks 
once in my booty shorts and purple camisole. I, I have the decency to put like a, a cardigan on over it, like a radial cardigan. So I think I probably looked terrifying, but uh, it was just what I needed. You know, I just, I just needed to have that, that comfort. I don't know why it needed to be so revealing, but <laughs> you know what? It was, uh, it was all just for me. And I finally took a shower and it ended. <laughs> and, that like, was that transformative or was that really just like, huh, I'd forgotten what that was like. The shower was a real turning point for me in terms of the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've seen, there are so many memes out there about, well, I've been washing my hands. Is it okay for me to start showering again? <laughs> so, I feel like many people are living in that zone right now. So thank you for, for joining those of us who have been. Uh, so um, not that we couldn't spend forever on fashion um, because, <laughs> you know, we could, but we're not going to right now anyway. Um, Speaking of, of writing and characters and the emphasis on the characters that you write kind of changing and you wanting to give them that life and that ability to to become, you know, more real, to breathe. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a character that you're particularly proud of that you've written that you kind of didn't expect to have um, transform into whatever they ended up becoming? There is. And it's in a book that has not been announced yet. But I'll tell just a little bit about it because what the heck, like there's no more rules. Um, <laughs> this woman is a, she's a trans woman. She's in her thirties. She is a um, forensic parapsychologist. She is a scientist who studies ghost behavior from a psychological point of view. And she has a complex emotional state. She's like a, difficult person to understand. And she is in some ways me, and she's in some ways some friends of mine, and she's sort of an amalgam of different ways that, that trans women that I have known and, and to an extent I am um, cope with the world around us. But it's not, the story's not about that. The story's about her and these ghosts, right? Um, oh, my publisher's gonna kill me. Um, but I am like super excited about that book uh, because there's so much of me in it and that character. And she gets so much space to breathe uh, in that book. And I'm really fortunate to, the, um, to the, my editors and the publishers of that, that particular book for letting me do it. Um, but of, of stuff that's, all, that's already come out, I really, really related to Alice in Alice's story in the magician's book, um, because she's just this sort of like really smart, um, emotional person who, she's a girl who doesn't quite know how to relate to other people, especially when we first meet her. And she's processing everything all the time. And I got to give a voice to her inner world which does not exist in the novels. And so I felt like I added an extra layer to the story of the book um, in a way that was really fulfilling for me. Uh, and I hope that people who read it also felt that way. Yeah, so a few of the things that you have worked on has been you taking characters that already exist in, in other works and, and putting your own spin on that. Um, how much freedom to to develop them are you given when you work on characters that are already um, created and out there existing in some form? Is there a lot of, um, are there strict rules on what you're able to do or is there some leeway there for you to, to turn it into something more or different? You always want to find a way to spin it into something of yourself, right? Um, when you're when you're writing these, you know, like with superheroes, you're writing characters that have been around sometimes 70, 80 years. And being true to that character is a weird equation because they've been so many things over the course of their existence. And there is an emotional core to them. Um, I think that this is sort of the, how that character is when you strip away everything else, there's some nugget of, um, like if you look at say Superman, who I've never written, but would, would love to, 
Superman has this core of, of kindness and honesty and um, politeness. And those things are essential to what he is. But he can have all sorts of other aspects that you can add on and you can work with to tell the story that you're trying to tell or to make him a character that you can relate to. And it also really depends on the situation um, and how much leeway your editors and publishers are willing to give you. <laughs> so, you know, at some point you'll get, uh, you'll get someone saying, well, that's not the character that I know. <laughs> but, oh, <laughs> that's what you don't want. Mm -hmm. Um, so speaking of kind of the editors and just the comics industry in general, um, you know, I, I know that we tend to hear some of the negative stuff about working in the industry, how difficult it can be for various reasons. Um, what are you grateful about when it comes to the comics industry as it kind of was, as it is, as it's evolving even now during this pandemic? Um, what's, what's the good stuff? My take on it is a little weird because I had this whole career where I was presenting as male and where everyone saw me as a man. And I was working with a lot of men doing things for, um, you know, for DC, for IDW, for Dynamite, for all these different companies. And it was not entirely a boys club. Um, by that point, but it was still a very male dominated kind of feel, you know? And after I transitioned, the kinds of jobs that I started getting, I've been really fortunate to work with a bunch of amazing women, a bunch of really cool um, non binary people, um, trans people, just a whole array of folks who are not those straight cisgender white men that we associate with a lot of the comic book industry or have in the past. And so I see this whole other comic book industry that exists within the industry as a whole of people who are telling different kinds of stories, who are prioritizing different things, who are trying to make comics more inclusive, who are trying to make comics um, um, appeal to vastly different audiences, um, which I think is wonderful, and I think it's how the, how the medium survives. I think there's always a place for, you know, dudes in tights and girls in tight outfits that guys like to look at. Like, it's fine, it's fine. Like, it's a big world, and, and everyone should be able to have the comics that they want, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think, what we're seeing more and more is this variety. Um, and, it, and it means that I have this little corner of the comic book industry where I feel very safe and comfortable and supported and even loved by the people that I work with, especially on a book like Lumberjanes, which feels like such a family kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm most comfortable. And I've never felt so lucky to be in comics than I do right now. So how do you see yourself um, continuing that trend of helping others to find that place of safety and comfort within the comics industry? You know, do you feel like you are able to actively create that for others? Is that something that um, you, you feel you would like to do, but have some things getting in the way of you being able to do that? Do you even want to do that for others? It's, it's so important to me. Um, both. It's, it's, it, there's two aspects to it. The first is creating content that makes people feel seen and understood and represented. That's something that is pretty much my mission in my career at this point, is to create books that showcase LGBTQIA plus characters, um, especially trans characters, and give readers characters that they feel comfortable with, you know, that they can look at and go, I know that person, or that person is me. Someone that they can really relate to. Um, 
that's part of it. And still tell amazing stories, um, just not with the same lens that we're used to seeing. Um, the second part of it is how do we open up the industry so that we have more creators of color, so we have more women creators, so we have more queer creators. Um, and that's something that I, I, I try to encourage people to, um, to get involved in comics as much as I can. And I try to advocate for those folks whenever I can, whenever I'm given the opportunity. Um, you know, if I, I have a book coming up where one of the main characters is a woman of color. And I said, I would really, really love it if the artist on this book was a woman of color, um, because that just makes sense to me. Um, and that's what we did. So I think if we're, if we're smart and we use our heads and we are doing what we care about, these things are going to come together. And what would you say are the roles of either readers or librarians, teachers, you know, those who aren't in the comics industry but are adjacent to it in some capacity? Um, what can we be doing? Like, what w do you think we should be doing to help diversify who is able to create? I mean, is there anything that we can do? You know, I talked to so many librarians, and I, I feel like librarians are, first of all, like the most amazing people. <laughs> Um, and I feel like librarians, so many of the, the ones that I meet are like already doing it. Like they're seeking out diverse titles and they're ordering books that, um, that aren't at the, you know, the top of the bestseller list, but they're ordering books that, you know, with the sense of, I want a variety of things for, um, you know, school librarians, I think do a really great job of, uh, of trying to get books for all of their kids, you know? And I would love it if, um, you know, if we had books so that any kid could go into their school library and see something on the shelf and go, oh, that's me. I recognize myself in this book and use that as a jumping off point to find other comics and other books. I guess there are other books besides comics. <laughs> I mean, a few. <laughs> um, and I think that's one of the great things about, about Lumberjanes specifically is that it offers so much and kids love it. And it provides such a kind and gentle picture of a, a world that is diverse and welcoming and open, you know? And so I think you, you read Lumberjanes and you go, oh yeah, this is how the world should be. You know, I would definitely want to live in this world. I think that's beautiful. Maybe with a few um, less bears, like <coughs> okay. well, the, the yes. bear situation's a little out of control sometimes. Um, I mean, but... some of the bears are women. Um, <laughs> you know, there's also there are yetis, there are giant birds. There's a lot going on in Lumber Jane's world that we should be wary of. Um, yes. <laughs> but the people, I think, all are pretty good-hearted. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do love um, how how representative they are of the wide variety of people that you can run into in everyday life. So I think that's that's really amazing that, yes, mm -hmm. it is giving children and teens and the adults who read them the opportunity to to see not just themselves, but to see other wonderful people who exist who just were not, you know, they were not spotlighted before and now they are. So it is yeah. a really amazing story in that way. But is there anything that you're reading right now that you have not created yourself um, where you see yourself in those stories? Oh my goodness. Um, let me think. This is, this is always the pop quiz question that I get that always throws me for a loop. And I always want to say like, give me a minute and I'll send you a list of good <laughs> things because I, I, nothing ever comes to mind. I, I fall back on a couple of things. I fall, always fall back on the Prince and the Dressmaker, which is an, uh, by Jen Wang, which is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful graphic novel about a gender non-conforming boy who is a prince who secretly wants to put on beautiful dresses and go out and be seen and um, creates this wonderful persona. Uh, and it causes conflict, but it's so beautiful and so wonderfully executed and, um, so I think 
you know, that's, that's my go-to in terms of, I, I look at that book and I think, well, you know, this is not a trans story, but this is a story about a, a story that approaches gender conformity in a way that makes me really happy, mm-hmm. you know? And I think if, if I were a 13 year old trans girl reading that book, I would think, well, this isn't me but it's close. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> something going on here that I like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of random question uh, or tangent question, I should say. Um, what was your favorite outfit in that book? Are you able to pick one? Oh my gosh, the clothes are so beautiful. Everything about that book, the clothes and the, um, the backgrounds um, are so gorgeously rendered. My favorite outfit is not the prince's, it's the prince's father's outfit at the very end is so over the top and amazing and so perfect for that character. Um, it just fills me with joy. Everything about that book feels, I, I think I cried four times the first time I read it. Ugh, love that book. Any subsequent crying when you go back to reread or is that out of your system at this point? <laughs> I might start crying right now. Well, if you need to, I can't hand you a hanky through the computer, but in spirit, I would. <laughs> um, so speaking also of supporting, you know, artists and, and writers who, who do put all this together because you create wonderful work. Um, the, the work that you just mentioned is, is fantastic. There's a lot of great stuff coming out there. We're seeing a lot more titles um, and libraries aren't the only place where we can get those. We love supplying those for people, but Um, comic shops are also really important to the whole ecosystem. Um, Mm -hmm. How do you see them playing into things? And do you have a favorite comic shop that you'd like to give a shout out to? Well, I don't like to play favorites when it comes to comic shops because there are many comic shops that I love. I will say my home comic shop, which has been my home for many, many, many years, is Austin Books and Comics here, right here in Austin, Texas. And, um, they have always done an excellent job of being welcoming and open and they have always um there is always a display of of queer comics that's given its own space um they really support uh women creators and they have a lot of female employees too which i think is important because when you come into a comic book shop and you are not sure what you want and you run into a guy who doesn't feel comfortable with, doesn't seem comfortable with you being there, that's a really intimidating experience. But if you walk in there and you see a girl with a blue side cut, you're like, we can talk, you know? And so I think that um, just having the, the diversity of the, the people who inhabit those stores, who work at the stores, um, plays a huge part in, in this changing ecosystem of comics. That's just, my view, I'm sure other people feel differently, mm-hmm. but yeah, I'm the one being interviewed, so ha. Huh. <laughs> exactly. You're the one who matters. Um, <laughs> so, Lila, have you visited your comic shop since you've gone into into quarantine, into sheltering in place, whatever you're, you're calling that? Well, I haven't. They're currently, um, they're currently shut down. Okay. Um, like many, many comic shops across the country. So Diamond, our big comics distributor, um, stop shipping orders as of this week. And so there are no new comics coming out. So a lot of stores are just closed. Some stores are still open in some capacity. They're doing um, door pickups or deliveries. And um, so I hope people will call their local comic shops and or look on their websites and find out what's going on because a lot of folks are still trying to do their best to sell those comics. And even if there's no new releases this week, there's still the stuff that has been coming out. There's still um, trade paperbacks. There's um, all kinds of stuff. And those folks really, really need your support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to switch gears a bit, um, looking at your, your Twitter profile, um, you are... <laughs> Don't make that face. <laughs> you are branded right now as the uh, the queen of nice. Which, the queen of nice, yes. Yeah, yeah, which which you chose to to include. So can you tell us a little bit more about where that came from, what that means? It's something that... So I've always been very big on kindness. 
I think kindness is very, very important. And one of the things that always made me very sad before I transitioned was that kindness and gentleness are things that are not considered masculine. And I was always scared to be kind and gentle, which is what I am as a person. And so it made it very difficult for me just to sort of be in the world. Um, since transitioning, um, I feel so much more free to do that uh, because I think that the tendency is to perceive kindness and gentleness as feminine qualities, right? Even though they're not necessarily. I mean, anyone can be kind, anyone can be gentle, but, um, but it's something that I try to do to excess. I try to be as kind as possible. And I think there's so much power in kindness. Um, and I think it requires a lot of vulnerability and strength to be very kind. So it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and preaching. And I tr do try to be very positive and loving and caring just as a person in my daily life, in my public whatever, on Twitter. Um, and so someone jokingly referred to me as the queen of nice uh, in a tweet a couple years ago. And I think I just popped it up there just to make them laugh and then never took it down. And so uh, sometimes people will go, you really are the queen of nice. And I love it when people say that. So <laughs> I leave it up. Just basically just fishing for a compliment on my Twitter bio. Was there an official coronation? Did you get a crown when this was declared? Do we need to fix that if you haven't? I should get a crown. I want a crown. I also want a scepter. Yes. I feel like okay. it's not, you know, complete without that. What about a cape or whatever they would be okay. called? I think, you know, I, I was watching The Crown, and you know when Elizabeth gets coronated? Coronified? coronified? <laughs> Not so, coronified. Yeah. You know, she, has, she has the scepter, and she also has like an orb, like some kind of orb. Um, and I want all that. I want the whole business, you know? So, so pretty, I can let's, be pretty extra. Yeah, let's, after this call, let's see if we can't find a time and place to properly get you coronated as the official Queen of Nice, because I don't think anyone will dispute that. Um, and I, I think it's, that. I think it's and well it, past time. So, uh, and I'm yeah. guessing like Westminster Abbey is probably empty right now. So we could. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it'd be too hard, but just in case <laughs> it is, I'll, I'll come in my mission impossible outfit so that right. we can sneak in, sneak out and, uh, hopefully not be seen. So perfect. All right. Uh, more details to come everyone on when we do that. Uh, but speaking of, of nice things that you do, um, one of the things that you, you share out on Twitter are the, the Is Your Trans Pizza Project, um, mm -hmm. an opportunity for, for folks to get a pizza from you. Can you share a little bit more about how that came about, why you do that? Just, you know, give us some insight into why your, how your niceness turned into this. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, I was doing my thing on Twitter like you do. And um, there's this sort of joke on trans Twitter that's like, um, like faux politicking. It's like, you know, if you really want to help trans women, you would buy them a pizza. Um, and I always thought that was kind of funny because who doesn't like pizza, right? It's just like, it's common sense. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I'm literally going to buy a trans woman a pizza. And so I said, hey, I'm going to give someone a pizza. Reply here if you want to be that person. And so I picked someone and I sent them $20 to buy a pizza. And I thought, well, that was fun. And so a couple of weeks later, I did it again. And, um, and then I, the, the germ of what it became actually came from someone else. Because they sent me a direct message and they said, um, you know, could I send you $20 and then you could give two people a pizza? And I thought... Hmm. There's something here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I gave two people a pizza that day. And then the next time I think I gave it to six people. And then it sort of became this exponential thing where like by the end I, I gave 126 pizzas away over one weekend. Wow. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, this is unsustainable because it took me like 18 hours to do all of the logistics of that. So I realized it would be better if I just gave out a pizza or two a day rather than doing it all at once. So that's what I started doing. And that's what I've been doing for the past year or so. And sometimes like, for instance, right now, because of the 
uh, whatever the thing is that's going on, the, the virus. It's a small um, thing. <laughs> we've got some little thing that's happening. Um, a lot of people have lost their jobs or um, they're otherwise under really serious financial strain. And so I raised the amount um, to give away um, in the hopes that people who needed the money would get it. Um, and I thought, well, I'll just give away all the pizza money all at once and then that'll be that. And then I'll be gone by the 1st of April. Um, and then I looked in my PayPal account and I saw that I still had the exact same amount of money even after giving it all away. And I thought, well, this is strange. And then I realized that like people have been giving me money to donate as fast as I could give it away, which is pretty amazing and impressive if you think about it. Because I don't really try that hard to raise money for it. I mean, I always say, if you want to donate, you go to this link, but I don't have like a telephone or anything. So people just on their own sort of are thinking, you know, I'd really like to help someone. I'd like to see someone get helped. And the nice thing about Trans Pizza is that it just kind of happens right there out in the open. It's like, I do this contest for some thing and it's like it's completely random you know there's no like you don't have to do anything to win but there's always a theme like um sh uh, you know reply with a funny picture of a cat or your favorite rodent or um which to which the answer is capybara i'm just saying um so there are always, right answers yes <laughs> so it's always fun and um and then someone gets you know helped at the end of it and I think people who have money to give like the idea of that. You know, it's like, oh, I can see this person got my money, you know? And I think that really matters because so often when we, we give money to like a charity, we're like, charities are big and they can do big stuff, you know, um, like disaster relief. And so, but you don't have that um, personal connection, you know, whereas like, Trans Pizza is very small and it only helps a few people, but the people that get helped really feel a personal connection to the people that are helping them. And I think that's really special. So if um, anyone wanted to contribute to that, where's the best place? If you don't know the link offhand, um, what's the path they can take to get to that link so that others can keep contributing to this really amazing project? Sure. Well, if you want to donate, you can just go directly to transpizza.org. Um, it's not a charity. It's not a 501c3. It's not tax deductible or anything like that. You're just basically giving money to some trans person, and I'm facilitating that. Um, <clears throat> and um, Or you can follow me on Twitter, Lila Sturgis. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing for folks. Um, and, and we're lucky to, to have someone like you, you know, who wants to help other people as much as he can and who can use their platform to do that. So um, thank you for, for your part in that. Um, it's really fun, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get to quiz people on things because you just told me there's right answers in all of this. So <laughs> I feel like it's a little bit of a Rorschach right. test where you're, you're testing <laughs> us to see um, a little bit more about us, too. So... There is one question that I will not answer, and that is how I feel about pineapple on pizza, because I, that is a very divisive question. And I have um, promised to remain neutral. I am the Switzerland of pineapple preference. Well, now you've piqued my curiosity, and we're going to see if we can find a way to get that out of you sometime. Um, but speaking of things that are uh, just kind of out there, um, we are in this thing, you know, we're, we're all kind of quarantined in this, in this whole pandemic. Um, what are you doing besides eating or not eating pineapple pizza to, mm -hmm. to help keep you sane? Um, and besides playing Animal Crossing, is there anything else that you're doing that's helping you um, to, to go through your days without completely losing it? Or are you losing it a little bit? Um, I would love to say that I'm not completely losing it. Uh, maybe I could be an inspiration to others, but no, I'm losing it just as much as everybody else. I'm having all the same emotions that everyone else is having, which I think is, it's kind of comforting in a way to know that we're all having these emotions. Is it, no matter what your situation is, you know, some people are having a really, really, really rough time right now. You know, some people are, you know, sick. Um, and some people are, have just lost their jobs. Some people have lost their homes. And um, 
and those people are experiencing a lot of really difficult stuff. And um, I think, you know, one of the ways to help yourself is to focus on ways to help those folks. And there's, in every community, there's ways to help and there's things that you can donate to. So I definitely encourage looking that stuff up. Um, but also, you know, for, for those of us who like our job is to stay at home and just not go outside, um, I, I, I think that um, it's important to just share how it makes us feel mm -hmm. with the people that we love and, and our friends um, because you're gonna feel it, you know? Like you can play Animal Crossing all day long, you can have the cushiest life imaginable and you can be that mentally healthiest person imaginable, which Lord knows ain't me, but <clears throat> you're still gonna feel it. And it's still traumatic and it's still tough on everyone. And so I think the more that we talk about it, the more we share, the more we allow ourselves to feel the feelings and to be vulnerable to them and to cry and be mad and um, in healthy ways. Um, I think that will keep us going. Yeah. Um, so do you foresee any of this making it into any of your future works? I mean, maybe not now, maybe not immediately, but do you ever see like a story down the road that talks about that one time when? I, I think we're all going to be deeply affected by this. And I think that that anyone who is creating stories, anyone who's creating any kind of art, that art is going to be tinted by what we're all going through and we're all going to recognize it. Um, the way that I tell stories, the way that I come up with stories is never as directed as that. I never think, oh, I'm going to tell a story about X. I always think, you know, you know what would be cool is if there was a kid on a horse trying to rope a wild robot. Um, and then I build the story from there. So if, the, if that somehow manages to work in feelings about coronavirus, then maybe. Um, but I would never set out to do that. Now, when can we expect your kid on a horse roping a robot story? Is that like hush hush or? I have pitched, I've pitched it. Um, so I'm in talks. This, this is true, actually. <laughs> it's an actual pitch that I have. Um, okay. <coughs> excuse me. That's not coronavirus, it's allergies. <laughs> well, the good news is you're already on your own right now anyway, so we're, we're all safe. But yes, please don't come down with anything. That would be awful on so many levels. Um, but with you in your home, do you have uh, any coworkers, furry ones, other, other people? The most important coworker of all, this is Greg. He works with me all day long. Hi. And Hi, Greg. My best coworker and buddy. He doesn't get much work done. He kind of mm -hmm. sleeps on the job quite a bit, mm -hmm. but he doesn't do things that other coworkers do. He doesn't climb on the keyboard. He doesn't try to get in the way of the um, the work that I'm doing. So we have a great relationship, don't we? Yes. We so do. do you think the sleeping on the job is going to show up in his evaluation when that time comes? You know, I think that everything is so. You know, we're in such uncharted territory right now that I don't know what those evaluations are even going to look like six months mm -hmm. from now. You Fair know? enough. So he may get off the hook, which good for him. Um, so speaking of quarantine and, you know, th this is a big thing, but the important thing to remember is we're going to get past this. And even if we don't know what that looks like, we're going to get past this. Yes. Um, what's your plans for when this is over, like, do you know the first place you want to visit or the first thing that you want to do um, as soon as we get this magical and mythical, you know, we're good, we're clear, go live? Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to go hug all of my friends. That's the very first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to go hug all of my friends. I'm going to go to every one of their houses. I'm going to give them the biggest hug. And then we'll, we can go from there. <laughs> I, I like that you're flexible, that you you know the important <laughs> thing, but you're willing to uh, to see what they have in mind, too. So that's I mean, that. probably it will involve sushi, I would guess, going out for sushi. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, so Lila, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that we have some attending uh, attendees in the in the audience. So I just wanted to open up for any questions if they happen to have any. If not, you and I are going to keep chatting about all of the the fun things that you're getting up to. But just wanted to throw that out folks in the audience. If you have any questions that you'd like for Lila to answer live, um, please do feel free to put those in the chat and we'll be happy to to ask those to her. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, um, yeah. There's been uh, there's been a lot of support of Greg and your <laughs> your choice of of comics. So um, yeah. we'll see if anyone comes with any fun questions. But um, so, do you have any other controversial uh, food thoughts that we should know about? Um, besides, you won't mention anything about pineapple and pizza, which fair. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to come out squarely against. Um, but is there is there anything else that you should let us know? Like, do you hate tacos? Like, what should I be preparing myself for on this side of, of the screen? Oh, my goodness. No, I love tacos. If I didn't love tacos, I would be in the worst place in the world. Um, we have the best tacos in Austin. That's just the truth. Um, but one thing that I, where I draw the line, absolutely, without question, is Brussels sprouts. They are disgusting. They smell like garbage. They look, to me, they literally smell like garbage. And when I, people eat them, I'm like, why are you eating actual literal garbage? But apparently other people don't see it that way. I don't know. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. So growing up, did you have a favorite food? Not even vegetable, just was there a food that you were like, I have to have this all the time? Like, you weren't necessarily allowed to, but that you could have gotten away with, you would have? My mom only made like, five things because my dad would only eat like five things and so when i was growing up i literally i think i thought there were only like five things plus mcdonald's in the whole world that you could eat um and one of the things that my mom always made was spaghetti with meat sauce and to this day i just made it the other night and it's to me it's like the most comforting thing in the world because it is so rich and like satisfying and um especially when it's cold outside and you can just let it simmer on the stove for a long time and pick up flavors and um, yeah. And the trick of course is finish the sauce, finish the noodles in the sauce, um, which I hope we all know by now. I hope that the world has all come to this conclusion together. You know, it's been so long since I've made spaghetti, I, that, which feels kind of scandalous to say. <laughs> it's, it's been forever. So I actually don't know how I cook it because it's been that long, but I'm going to take your advice. Um, you. But when it comes to your time, so do you have things that you really like to do? Like is cooking something that you enjoy doing when you're not working on stories or songwriting? Like what are the things that you like to do just normally to to kind of, um, pass the time to have fun. I, this is something I actually, I, I was going to make something up. I'm going to be honest. I struggle. I struggle with that. I struggle with, um, as I'm a person who has a very, um, I guess a charitable way to say it would be I have a very active imagination, which another way to say it is that um, I'm a lazy daydreamer. Um, and so fortunately, I can parlay that into sounding like work, like, I could be like, well, I was thinking about a story for six hours while I laid on the couch that day. <laughs> That's work, right? But in a sense, it is work. It is part of my work. And it's where a lot of my, my best stories come from are sort of that just sort of like, I am just sitting here. <laughs> if there's an episode of, of Seinfeld that has always stuck with me where Jerry asked Elaine what she did the other day and she said, I did nothing. And I, I literally, I just sat in a chair and stared. And I thought, <laughs> that's so real. <laughs> so if you had to choose a TV show that kind of encapsulated your life experience, would it be Seinfeld or is there something else that speaks to kind of like, this is an accurate portrayal I feel, you know, called out on? <laughs> Seinfeld is too nihilistic. I, I think that um, if I could be in a TV show, I would want to be in The Good Place. I would want to be, um, I would want to be Tahani because she's really tall and pretty. <laughs> I think I lost the thread of the question. <laughs> well, just if there is a TV show that is kind of um, emblematic of like that feels a little bit close to home. Um, <laughs> is there one? 
I don't know. My life is not, um, it's not very filmic. I, I, I think that I would love to create that show. I think I would like to have that show. I would like to create a show that's full of the, the people that are in my life who I don't really see on television still. Um, just a bunch of, of queer, emotional people with problems who cuddle a lot. I think we need that on television, I think. Okay. So like a queer cuddling sex in the city possibly where it's, you know, looking at close friendships. Yes, I would love that. Okay, so I feel like you and I are brainstorming here. Like I we're like finding we that. I think we're, co I think we're co creating a show, is what we're doing. Yeah, so I'm really excited <laughs> for that to air. We'll have to, you know, pitch this to a few places, see, you know, who's going to let us get our vision. But I know um, some people. Well, <laughs> I'll talk to my guy. <laughs> All right, so yeah, you talk to your guy who can talk to someone else's guy, and, and we'll go yeah. from there. So <laughs> I feel really good being able to say that the American Library Association and Lila Sturges pitched a TV show, of all things, not about comics um, during the pandemic. That feels like that in and of itself could be a story. Yes, that's true. Well, we did get a question. Oh, yeah, I was going to say this is Amy. Um, so uh, Lila and Aaliyah, this is a question. What have you been reading while you've been stuck inside or watching? And so everyone as attendee, I just encourage you to drop your questions in the Q&A button. I am currently reading, I'm pulling it up on my Kindle because I'm currently reading a, a book. It's actually the companion to a TV series called The History of Ancient Britain. But the TV series like ended or it's not complete yet. Um, and I wanted to read the, the book and it sort of traces the, the story of Britain from the first time people walked onto it when it was a peninsula thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago up until the end of the Roman occupation. And it's such a fascinating story of humanity, especially during the stone age in Britain when you have all these huge um, megaliths going up and um, it's utterly fascinating and it's nothing like what's going on in the world right now. Um, and I, I think, and I just got to the part of uh, when the Romans were conquering Britain and there's this ama amazing woman named Bodica. Have you heard of this woman? No. She is the coolest. She was a, um, the wife of the Iceni tribe. They were a, a Celtic tribe that lived in Northern England and um, when her husband died, uh, her, she was supposed to get, she and her daughters were supposed to get his estate, but the Romans were like, you know, we're just gonna take that. And she said, you know what, no, you're not. And so she assembled this huge army of Celtic warriors and rode at the head of it in her chariot and defeated an enormous British army, uh, an enormous Roman army. Um, just this amazing, incredible woman. She eventually lost and poisoned herself. But while it was going on, it was really amazing. <laughs> like history is not kind to heroes, let's be fair. But she was an incredible woman. I was like, I need to write a story about her because she's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that mm -hmm. sounds fascinating. Um, no, had never heard. And that's one of the really cool things though about history is there's so much to, to explore within it. Um, so we are down to about two minutes to go. So Lila, before we start to wrap things up, I wanted to ask, um, are, are there any parting thoughts that you have, um, whether it's to, to put a little bit more cheer into people's days or um, just general advice, um, just anything that you'd like to, to share with everyone to, to kind of send us off um, in, a, yes. in a happy place? I would remind everyone that we're all feeling strong emotions right now, whether we're showing it or not. And to be extra kind and understanding right now to the people in your life. They're struggling too, even if they're not showing it. And we have to be there for each other. It's so important. It's so important. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. It's, it's been a true pleasure. I'm glad that we have about five projects now lined up. So if you thought you were getting a break anytime soon, um, sorry to burst that bubble for you. Um, yes. We will make sure to um, drop some some links for some of the things that you mentioned when we post this, so everyone can can contribute to your pizza project, which is amazing. Um, so that they can find you on social media. Um, but again, thank you so so much for joining us today. It was, it was a true pleasure. 
Oh, I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lila.